Thank you very much. Um, welcome to our first session of the New Year. So we wish you all a very happy New Year. And uh, we thank you for attending our events. Um, just a few logistics points. Uh, uh, if you didn't get an invitation directly from us, you can uh, get a <coughs> business card with the box over there. And you can also contribute to our programs by putting money in our uh, cash box, which is also maybe you can show where the Meshi uh, box and the cash boxes are. There here. Okay. So uh, we're extremely happy to have Douglas McLean, who will speak for about half an hour on this issue of uh, marriage migrants in Asia. Uh, and uh, afterwards, we'll have our usual uh, Q&A session. So as you know, it's very informal. Uh, so Douglas, the um, floor is yours. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you everybody for coming on Friday night, especially on a Friday night. And thank you so much uh, to Robert and to Temple University for uh, so kindly inviting me to give this talk. Uh, my name is Doug McLean. I'm a Fulbright Scholar over at the University of Tokyo. Not at the main campus, I'm over at Komaba, um, just off of Shibuya. I'm here for a year working on uh, marriage migration into Japan and particularly issues of human trafficking that occurs in marriage migration. And today I'm going to be talking about something a lot broader, which is just the general topic of marriage migration, particularly in Asia. And one of the great things about this topic is that just about everybody here in the room has probably heard about foreign brides, marriage migration, something like that at some point whether it's in the newspapers, on TV, here in Japan, or at home. What that tells us is that it's not just a local phenomenon. It's not something that happens just somewhere else. It's happening in the very places that we live, whether that's here in Japan, North America, Southeast Asia, or over in Western Europe. And because this is a very large topic, and I've got 30 minutes to talk about, about, about it as much as I can, I'm gonna hit just the major highlights assuming that we're all coming to this just with general background knowledge. And then once we hit the Q&A session, we can actually talk a little bit deeper. Basically, why is this stuff happening? Some of the legal issues, I'm a lawyer. Um, and also, uh, you know, basically what's happening here in Japan. So I come at it from a legal perspective, but I'll be talking about it a little more generally. Um, also, I think this thing is just to record my voice. Can everybody hear me OK? Yes. OK. Um, all right, so let's get started with this. Okay, so first of all, let's do the roadmap. What are we going to be talking about here for the next 30 minutes? Uh, the very first question that I get asked when I talk about international marriage migration is, well, why are you studying this? And the underlying question is, why are we talking about this? Why do we care? That's part one. And one of the big reasons that deserves its own couple of slides is that marriage migration is increasing, especially here in Asia. And then the more interesting part is, well, why do people do it? And how do they do it? And then we're going to talk about just some of the big issues in marriage migration. Now, of course, we know or probably have heard about some of the challenges that individual people migrating from their home country to another country will face when they arrive, they get married, and they live in a new place. But what's not really talked about are the national issues. As a country, as government leaders, what does it mean when you have a bunch of people uh, marrying internationally? And additionally, what can go wrong? And by the way, all these pictures are from uh, various issues of marriage migration. These are Vietnamese women uh, off to, I believe, Taiwan and Singapore. Uh, this is a marriage broker agency. This is one of the big parts that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it's my specialty. Guys in Singapore, these are his Vietnamese wives uh, that he is going to be connecting uh, to husbands. And these are Vietnamese brokers who broke the law. Marriage brokering is illegal in Vietnam. Never mind that we have a lot of Vietnamese marriage migrants coming up to uh, Northeast Asia. So. And of course, OK, part one, why are we talking about these? So let me give you a bit of background about myself. I started on this whole issue uh, back in 2010 at the UN Interagency Project on Human Trafficking down in Bangkok. Um, I was a legal intern there. I was going to law school at the time. And before then, I had had a background in human trafficking, working on the issue in the United States uh, for the uh, California state government. And so when I went down there for a legal internship, 
uh, my boss at the time said, you know what, we've been hearing this, this phrase, marriage traffic, in the region. People are talking about it. Governments are worried about it. We don't know what it is. Go find out. And so I started to investigate it. And the first thing that I immediately noticed was, I have no idea what marriage migration is. I don't even know why this whole route of trafficking is happening. So the first thing I had to do was figure out why people were going from each of these countries and going off elsewhere. And uh, the law doesn't tell you a lot about that, so I went to uh, my friends in the anthropological world. And this is one of the things that the field research that they did uh, brought up. I don't, and can every, everybody see this okay? We're good over here. Right. I'm going to paraphrase it particularly since it's not the biggest here. Um, this is in. This is from a, a small village in southern Vietnam, and basically it, it says that you know cross-border marriage is pretty common in our area, and not only the local people know about it, the authorities know about it, the local government knows about it, and they think it's a pretty effective way to reduce poverty. It's one of the reasons why marriage migration happens. We're going to talk about more of the issues later on, but this was one of the big things I found. And it wasn't just limited to Vietnam. It was Thailand. It was Burma. It was Myanmar, sorry. Cambodia, Vietnam, all those places. Uh, this was a common theme. And it's going to tie into issues of globalization um, and uh, income inequality. OK. Additionally, zoom in on this a little bit. At least for the Mekong region, there's a lot of migration going on. And it's not just internal. As you can see on this list here, you have people going from this region out everywhere. You have people going up to South Korea, up to Japan, um, up to China, and up to the Taiwan area, all the way over to Western Europe. They go everywhere. And this is just the Mekong region, so you can imagine what's happening elsewhere. China, by the way, is still one of the largest exporters of marriage migrants. They go everywhere. But zooming back in to the actual individual people, this is one of the big phenomena that happens on an individual level. On a level. Um, these people are leaving their own communities. They're heading off to some place they've never been before. They're changing their own lives. They're changing the lives of the people that they connect with. Their migration impacts both the receiving community and the sending community. This is one of the big human stories of the 21st century increasing migration. And this is a big piece of it, marriage migration. Now, this is an Air Asia route map, but this is a great example of what marriage migration actually looks like. This, the center there is Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And I can just about guarantee you that on almost every one of these routes, there have been marriage migrants that have gone. And if we were to blow this up to the entire globe, you would see lines like this all throughout. This is a part of globalization. This is connecting various places to other places, this time through marriage. And as the level of marriage migration increases, so do the people who take advantage of this, for good and for bad. Not everybody can just go and find themselves a husband or a wife in another country. They need help. They need somebody who knows the destination country. And there are people who make a business of this. Now, for those people in the audience who are from Japan or who have been in Japan for a while uh, or who are familiar with the concept of homiai, the arranged marriages, matchmakers, kind of seems like this. It's a little different. This is commercial. Once they have their connection, they're done and they move off. But you can see that sort of connection between the old style matchmaking and now the much larger, more commercialized business. And that's my focus of research. And then, of course, um, on the national level, countries face various challenges and opportunities in sending and receiving these people, including uh, some international criminal challenges. So this is the broad sweep of the topic, by the way. And this is a lot to talk about in 30 minutes, so I'm just going to touch on it. If you see something in these slides that piques your interest, keep it in mind, and then when we do the Q&A, we can explore it further, because we have an hour to talk. And of course, for me, human trafficking is a big issue. OK, so first of all, let's talk about marriage migration increasing. Let's put up a box, and let's talk about a few countries in our neighborhood and regions. We got the Taiwan region, 
we have South Korea, we have Japan, and we have mainland China. Uh, most of the time when you think about destination countries, you think of South Korea, Japan, and the Taiwan region. You don't really think about mainland China. But my research shows that mainland China doesn't just send people, it receives people, a lot of people. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Let me just show you some numbers though. Now I have brides up here instead of marriage migrants for a really good reason. None of my research really showed any men uh, migrating for marriage. Doesn't mean they don't exist, they, sh they definitely do. But particularly through brokered routes, it's almost always women in Southeast Asia and up here in Northeast Asia. So in general, I'm talking about women. The numbers I'm gonna show are within the last few years, they're not exact, um, they're what the governments will report. Um, Taiwan, for example, has about 240,000 foreign brides. They had maybe a tenth of this 20 odd years ago. So within one generation, they went from hardly any to this number. 140,000 of those people are from Vietnam. The number is growing. Meanwhile, South Korea has about 100,000 less. They were a little bit later to the game, but they've been bringing in more and more wives on a faster and faster basis. They actually have a program called Multicultural Families, and they're actually promoting this. Uh, they recognize they have a population problem, just like Japan and Taiwan does, and they're trying to solve it with American. And then Japan has the largest number overall. Um, this number, by the way, looks very specific. Um, this is the number of people who registered for a spouse visa, uh, number of women who registered as a spouse visa, from 2000 to 2011. The problem is that's not all marriage migrants because there was international marriage going on before 2000. But this just gives you an idea of the number of people that have been coming in in the last 11 years, at least since the turn of the century. Mainland China, sadly, is all anecdotal, but I just wanted to share my own research. When I was down in Bangkok, we had story after story of women going from uh, Vietnam and from Myanmar, crossing the border. Borders, they're very easy to cross. Sometimes it's the same minority groups there that can come across. And I was asking the people uh, at a branch office up in Beijing, well, why is this? And they said, of course, the one-child policy. The big problem is that under the one-child policy, if you can only have one child, and your culture says that it's better to have a boy than to have a girl, and you have the technology to make sure that it's a boy, you're going to end up having more boys than girls. Um, I've heard various estimates. One estimate is that by the year 2020, so seven years from now, there will be a deficit of 40 million women of marriageable age. So it will be 40 million men looking for brides who won't have it numerically. That's where the big demand is coming from. To put that into perspective, uh, 40 million is the number of all Vietnamese women, from zero to 100, in Vietnam. The country has 80 million people, about 40 million women. So that level of demand is huge on those neighboring countries. Okay. And then the numbers look all well and good, but let's give you an idea of what percentage of the couples we're talking about. So today, about one in nine marriages that take place in Taiwan uh, are international marriages between a Taiwanese national or permanent resident and a foreign bride. Uh, South Korea is a little bit lower, 111, and Japan is quite a bit lower, 1 in 20. But still, when you think about 1 in 20, look around the room. You probably have, you have at least two. At least two. And if you go to some parts of Japan, this number is going to be much higher. And it's probably true for South Korea and Taiwan as well. These people aren't evenly distributed throughout each country. They're clumped in various places. Um, mainland China, who knows what the number is? It's a very small proportion of the population. It actually means more to the neighboring countries who are sending people. Um, the other reason I put mainland China up here is this is the country to watch in the future. They're going to be bringing in a lot of marriage migrants. And so how Japan, how South Korea, and how Taiwan deal with the issue will be important uh, for mainland China to figure out how it should deal with its own marriage migrant issue. OK, so these are the numbers. Let's get back to why. Why is this happening? And again, these are very broad themes. Uh, first of all, well, globalization. All right. But what does that mean? I'm going to just give you a couple of meanings. This is not everything. Number one, it's easier to migrate. 
really easy. And when I say easy, I mean cheap. So I went into uh, my favorite website, AirAsia. Love AirAsia. Buy AirAsia. I don't get paid to say that, but I'm going to say it. Buy AirAsia. Uh, you can go from Hanoi to Seoul for 35,000 yen. Uh, Bangkok to Haneda for 33,000 yen. Um, this was if I booked it a month in advance. Maybe you can get a better discount. Um, that's not a lot of money. Now, that's a lot of money if you are from a very poor part of Vietnam. But most of the time, when they're going through a broker, it's the husband that's going to pay for it. That's nothing. And just 20, 25 years ago, you would have had to add a zero to some of these numbers. So it's gotten a lot cheaper to travel. For the broker business, communications are so much easier. You just get on Skype. You call your sending country, you call your people there, you can make things happen. You can do stuff over email. In fact, if you go onto Google and start typing in the appropriate uh, Japanese phrases, you can actually find these marriage brokers like that. They'll come up. And they'll be separated by what nationality. So if you feel like getting yourself a Chinese bride, they've got those websites. If you want a Thai bride, they've got those websites. It's that much easier to do business. And then finally, a lot of the economic and social forces that are happening right now are creating this additional demand, and also the supply. And what I'm talking about here very generally, of course, is there are parts of the world that are advancing economically much faster than others. You've got this gap. OK. So let's go to the why do it and the how part. I'm going to talk about three things. So first of all, we're going to talk about the poll factors. Why do some countries want to get foreign brides? And I'm going to use a Taiwanese example because it's the one um, that I looked at most before coming here. The nice thing about talking about Taiwan as well, we have a lot of the same issues that Japan does in terms of demographics and demand. Um, as a matter of fact, when I mentioned that 140,000, or I'm sorry, 240,000 uh, brides you can see how big of an impact it has on Taiwan by the fact that they actually have a daytime soap opera about it. That's how big it is. That's the impact it's had on their culture. OK. And then we're talking about the push factors. Why do, in this case, most of the time women, why do they want to do this? Or why do they feel they have to do it in those cases? And then finally, we're going to talk about how brokered marriages work. So I'm going to show you one of the supply chains, how this business model actually works uh, in one case example. OK. So poll factors. Why are Taiwanese men, in this case, uh, looking to get brides? Well, the first thing is it's not all uh, Taiwanese men. It's mostly those men from lower economic levels, both in the cities and particularly out in the countryside. And here's a couple of pictures. You've got your factory workers. Uh, this guy owns a small restaurant in uh, Taipei, and this is his Vietnamese wife. So there's some, some reasons that make them look abroad uh, for wives. Uh, first of all, um, anthropologists tell us that there's few uh, marriage prospects. So just like Japan, you have more and more women leaving the countryside for the city, usually Taipei, one of the other bigger cities. They also are putting off marriage, because in Taiwan, and in South Korea, and here, um, they often have to make a choice between uh, family and work, and more and more choosing work, and putting it off. And so that leaves the men with fewer prospects among the local population. Um, additionally, getting married costs a lot of money. So if you're from a, a lower background, um, it's hard to put that money together. It sounds really simple. I'm oversimplifying it. But that was one of the things that kept coming up in the anthropological research. Finally, if you're coming from the countryside, well, and you're staying there on your farm, or you work in the factory, there's just not that many women around. Now, to connect this back to Japan, I used to live in Akita. Lived there for two years. It's on the JET program. And we <coughs> saw this a lot. They were always talking about, we need to get married, but there's no women around. Um, some of you who've been here for a while may remember uh, times when people, particularly from Tohoku, would ride their tractors down into Tokyo and have sort of a, a marriage jamboree and try and get wives. <laughs> Usually it didn't work. <laughs> For some reason, the women were not attracted to men on tractors and living in Akita. <laughs> I don't know why. Akita food is delicious. The language is difficult, but it's a nice place. Uh, but apparently it's not as fond as Shibuya. So 
They give up. <laughs> now, uh, for those who uh, have been here for quite some time, you might remember how some of the local uh, governments up in northern uh, Tohoku actually worked with brokers to take their men on marriage tours to China and the Philippines and other places. So it became such a problem that those governments, the local governments, were actually trying to get their men married. And they were somewhat successful, but there were problems involved in that. And if you're interested in that history, I'm happy to talk about it a little bit and what happened afterwards. Because the problem still remains. It hasn't been solved. But the government kind of took its hands off the issue uh, in the mid-90s. Okay, so a few marriage prospects among local women. And for the Taiwanese, the big question was, well, why are they going after Vietnamese women? So it turns out that as a cultural stereotype, um, they view uh, Vietnamese women as kind of close to them in terms of culture. Uh, that Vietnamese culture and Taiwanese culture are broadly seen as having the same Confucian background. And the image that the brokers, in fact, love to push is that Vietnamese women are like traditional Taiwanese women. They're the type of women that used to be in Taiwan. Uh, which means they'll take good care of you, they'll work on the farm, they'll do their chores without uh, really being told what to do. And so that's, and that's what really pushes it. Now, the backside of this is that there's a lot of racism and discrimination <coughs> against Taiwanese there. So on the one hand, they're looked as uh, appropriate wife material, but they're also seen as lower than the Taiwanese. So it's a little complicated. There's also cultural pressure to marry. Now, uh, for some of you who have uh, you know, studied the pressures uh, that women, particularly in developing countries, face in trying to get married, uh, this is something that isn't really studied enough, and that is what pressures are on the men to get married. Now, in Japan, for example, in Japan, uh, a lot of my uh, female colleagues would say, oh, well, I really need to get married by this age, um, and my parents are pushing me to get married by this age. Well, it turns out the men get the same thing. Um, particularly in Taiwan, and to some extent in South Korea, too. For those living in the countryside, it's about having a family and passing on the land to the next generation. You get that, that sort of pressure. And on top of that, it's better in that society to be a married man and to be a father than it is to be a single man. Not bad to be a single man, but it's better uh, to be a father uh, and a husband. And so there's a lot of cultural value to getting married, and they feel that pressure. And this is the interesting thing. Um, particularly in Taiwan, brokered marriage is a traditional matchmaking. Um, I have not studied the issue enough on mainland China, but I understand in mainland China, the traditional matchmaker uh, still exists, particularly in the countryside area. And uh, in talking to some of the anthropologists uh, from Taiwan, from the local anthropologists, they said, yeah, you know, our, our parents, either they or some of our aunts and uncles, um, they went through this brokered marriage. That was just how things were done back in that generation. So there's still a high acceptance of brokered marriages. Even if the brokers are no longer the matchmakers, the brokers are now uh, people who are just doing this for a profit. They're doing it for a business. And on top of that, these brokered marriages are cheap. We were looking at some numbers uh, that were quoted in the anthropological materials. And you could get yourself a marriage for about $8,000 US in about three years ago. Now, of course, you could pay more. If you wanted to have the nice one-week one trip in Hong Kong Bay uh, up in, uh, in northern Vietnam, um, you know, it might cost you ten or $12,000. But in terms of uh, this level of worker's salary, maybe we're talking six-month salary. And that includes getting your uh, list of potential women, reading their profile, looking at the pictures, and then flying over to Vietnam, having a meeting with them, doing the whole thing going back home, waiting for the wife to come over, between eight and $12,000. Incidentally, it's a bit more expensive in Japan. The numbers I have are out of date, but as of about four or five years ago up in Tohoku, you would be paying two to three million yen. So that sounds about right. So you have to sound up month, something like that. And that's a lot up there. That's at least a year's salary in some places, not more. Um, so for Taiwan, it's cheaper. South Korea is still cheaper than Japan. Japan, as in many things, seems to be the most expensive in the region. So these are some of the reasons why men feel pressured to get married. Aside from the regular reasons of just, I want a wife, I want to have kids. All right, so let's take a look at it from the other end. Um, incidentally, the, the, um, 
the research that I did down in Bangkok was from Vietnam to China, looking at both mainland China and the Thailand region. So that's why we're looking at the Vietnamese example. So the first thing that I thought was, well, if you're poor, you're likely to want to go off and be a marriage mic. That was not true. You had to be poor and not have stable job opportunities. If you were poor, but you had a stable job, your chances of wanting to go abroad for marriage were much lower. <coughs> and we had some great field researchers uh, down in UNIA um, who actually went and looked at uh, some of these examples on the ground. Uh, this is from the, from the World Bank, but basically what they found was what lines up here. Like the red is the poorest, the yellow is the next poorest. So the marriage migrants that went to Taiwan originally were mostly coming from down here, just south of uh, Ho Chi Minh City. This is where the Mekong River kind of ends. It's delta, you have farmlands, uh, it's pretty poor. Up here you have the mountainous areas uh, bordering Yunnan province with China. You have a lot of hill tribes and you have some pretty extreme poverty. They're the ones that are crossing the border overland into mainland China, often disappearing entirely. And the reason why is they didn't have many stable job opportunities and were poor. Of course, you had the societal expectations of marriage. You're a woman, you're supposed to get married. Now the thing is, and this is one twist, in the Vietnamese context, the women are expected to contribute to their, what they call their natal, or their, their home families, when uh, necessary. So if your home family was poor, even if you went to some other country and had a great marriage, you're expected to send money back and support your family. Incidentally, this is also true uh, for domestic migration. If you go from the poor south up to Ho Chi Minh City, and you do really well, you're expected to send money back. And so one way of supporting your family, of course, is to do this international marriage. If you're lucky, you'll, you'll uh, get into a richer country, you might be able to get a job, <coughs> or your husband might be willing to send some money back to your family. And speaking of money, let's talk about the attraction of wealth here. Um, and I'm sorry, this is way down at the bottom. I will read this uh, for the people in the back. Um, so there was a focus group that was done uh, by one of our researchers at UNIAP, and they said, uh, you know, they helped their families build big houses, buy expensive scooters, which they could not afford before. When they come back to visit their families, they look beautiful with expensive clothes and jewelry. Now, this interviewee was talking about um, women who had gone to Taiwan, gotten married, and then come back home to visit. And they would come off the plane, just dressed really uh, richly. And that was very impressive to, to the people locally. Now let me tell you, there's no greater motivation than when you're sitting in your house and you look two houses down and the house that used to be there is now two stories. It's a brick building. You've got motor scooters out front. There's a satellite dish there. And all the kids have cell phones. And you have nothing. And it's because their daughter went off to Taiwan. Or at least so the story goes. Well, you see that and you think, well, I can do that. <laughs> or God help you, your parents think, oh, she can do that. <laughs> and then the pressure begins. And this is really sort of a, a community mindset. And let me show you how it becomes. And let me uh, interpret this for you. So ignore the red part. Just take a look at the blue part. This is before they're married. And if you add up the numbers, about 90% are either very poor, poor, or average. And that 90%, two thirds of them are either very poor or poor. Now, after marriage, <laughs> You have almost the exact opposite. You have about 90%, sorry, 80-some 80, 80 percent who are average or above average. Another 10% who are rich. The shift is dramatic. Um, this incidentally um, was, let's see, it looks like 2000, it was 2000, okay. So this was done, I believe, about 2006 or seven. Um, a couple of anthropologists went down into rural Vietnam where they had found a number of these marriage migrants villages and they interviewed I think about 300 some odd families and this was the trend that they saw. And so when you see this level of success you only think about the positive. Yeah, I want to go to Taiwan, I want to go to South Korea, you know, I'd rather marry somebody locally but you know, if this will make my life better and my child, my future child's life better, yeah, okay, this sounds good. 
or even, hey, I want to go, just because it's a better life. And this is the same quote that I had at the beginning, um, that this is a common strategy. Okay, but here's the problem. Um, you have a lot of people wanting to go. You have a lot of people looking. But both groups of people are not really good at finding each other. You've got a language barrier, you've got a cultural barrier, travel's expensive. You want to get it right the first time. This sounds like an amazing business opportunity, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about this business opportunity. This is an example uh, that I put together basically from the Vietnam to the Taiwan side. So we got the bride and her family on that end, and we got the groom and his family here. Let's put them together and let's see how the money flows. All right, so step one, you have a local recruiter. This is the person that goes to the countryside who finds uh, women who be <coughs> eligible brides. How do they meet? Well, through a family and social network, a friend of a friend, or maybe even you know, their aunt or uncle, a relative is doing this recruiting work or knows the recruiter. <coughs> So the bride says, okay, I'll go with you. And so the local recruiter takes this potential bride to the larger recruiter in the city. <coughs> Usually, um, in this case, it would be Ho Chi Minh City or Hanoi. And so what happens there is it's not just one woman. There's a bunch of potential brides there. It takes time to connect these people to potential husbands from Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, and South Korea. So. Local recruiter gets paid, and the potential brides get put in housing. So the broker has housing. <coughs> okay, so that's where they are. Meanwhile, over in Taiwan, same thing happens as before. The prospective groom and his family meet the recruiter through family and social networks. Okay. And the same thing as before, there's a large recruiter in Taipei. Now, this is just one example. There's various ways this can happen, but the examples I looked at always had the groom and his family sending a lot of money. Notice this line is much thicker than that little green line over there. Sending a lot of money directly over to here, and then the larger recruiter will give the local recruiter a commission. That happens. Okay, so now we have the groom interested, and we have some potential wives over there in the housing. And this is what happens. This is, I counted this, we can see about 13 women this, I believe, was down in, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City in a hotel. This is small. We had plenty of stories of women, 25 women, 50 women, 75 women. And not just one guy, but three, four, five guys. Still, only five to 75 is quite a number. They all go down there for a few days. They will meet with a ton of women, pick out a few they like. If they have time, they'll go out on some dates. I don't know how they're talking. Because one speaks Taiwanese, Chinese, Mandarin, the other is speaking Vietnamese. Um, and somehow the husband, potential husband says, yes, I think that one. And this can happen over and over again. So that lady there in the blue might be there for several months. And if after about six to eight months, uh, nobody picks her, she usually has to go home. So let's say, though, that this guy has picked his woman. He says, okay, I want you. What happens next? Well, we now have to get the woman over to Taiwan. <coughs> and there's this whole legal process that they have to go through. Oh yeah, and first of all, most importantly, money. So if they get a successful connection, then the large recruiter, who's gotten a lot more money, gives some of that money to the large recruiter in Vietnam. That's how the money works. This one is paying the money. That side is not. <coughs> then what happens is a large recruiter grabs a translator, grabs a travel agent, gets a lawyer for some of the paperwork, goes and visits city officials, maybe pays a little bit extra if things are moving slowly, or if the woman doesn't have proper paperwork, because remember, she comes from the countryside, she might not have a birth certificate. Not all of them do, or they lost it. And to get that thing sent again takes too much time, so you pay a little extra and get it expedited. And meanwhile, in this whole time, the woman has said, okay, I'm gonna marry him. Money has exchanged hands. Now, for the broker to keep that money, he has to make sure that the woman is not gonna just take off somewhere. So let me read this quote to you since it's a little bit low. The matchmaker also acts as the guardian of the bride 
in the period when she waits to join her husband. So matchmaker, basically the broker, is watching the bride, monitoring her to make sure that she does not run away or commit any immoral acts. They weren't clear what immoral acts were. We were thinking, particularly the folks on the ground were thinking immoral acts might just be, you know what, I don't want to do this marriage, I want to go home. There are cases where that will happen, where the broker will say, no, you said yes, you're going to stay. Other cases, it could just be she has a boyfriend on the side, doesn't want that to happen. Uh, from the broker's perspective, she's the important product. Without her, he doesn't get paid. So, let's say all this happens properly. They've gone to the Taiwanese, uh, what is it, economic and cultural office to get the appropriate paperwork to get over to the Taiwan region. What then happens is the uh, bride to be heads over to Taipei, usually meets with the large recruiter, gets sent to the local recruiter, and then gets uh, over to the groom and or his family. And so now we've delivered the bride. And occasionally, occasionally, if you look over there, a little bit of money goes back to the bride's family. Now there's various ways to interpret that. Um, some interpretations are, that's a dowry, that's a bride price, that's a traditional cultural thing. In the worst cases though, that could be the parents actually wanting to get money and so they push their uh, daughter into a marriage. Or the daughter says, no, actually, don't give me the money, give it to my family. There's various uh, ways this can happen. And it doesn't always happen. That's a very tiny piece of money. So that's that's a supply chain. That's one example. So let's talk about some of the things that we run into here with marriage migration. And before I do, I'm already over time, aren't I? Yes, so you have three more minutes. Oh, awesome, okay. <laughs> We're gonna go super fast. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna just bring up the bullet points. Let's take a look at them. And then if something sounds interesting, let's talk about it during the hour, okay? All right. All right. So, big issues. You've got the personal opportunities and dangers. Maybe you get a better life. Maybe you get trafficked. Additionally, governments are seeing more and more marriage migrants coming in. We saw the numbers a few slides back. That has real policy implications. If you suddenly have 140,000 Vietnamese women, okay, over 10 years, but still, coming in who don't speak the language, who don't know the culture, and you have Taiwanese people who don't know these people, who can't speak to them, who don't know who they are, it creates various um, cultural issues that have to be solved, at least partially through various policy changes. How do you accept them into your country? And of course, uh, there's also an inter international dimension to this. There are countries sending and there are countries receiving. And at least in terms of international criminal organizations using marriage migration, you need both sides talking to each other. Okay. This one I'm going to have to skip. Um, I was going to talk about what can actually happen if you're a marriage migrant. If you're lucky, you get a good marriage. If you're less lucky, you get a, a marriage where there's discrimination, maybe some domestic violence. Uh, you're treated as less than uh, an equal human being. There's this huge sort of gray or yellow area where worse things can happen, including domestic violence, or the broker not telling you uh, everything about the husband that you should know. Like maybe he already has children from a previous marriage. Uh oh, I'm about to get the cane. All right, we're gonna fast forward. In the worst case scenario, we have forced marriage or human trafficking. You know what? We're gonna stop right there, because there's enough to talk about already. And this is gonna go up, I believe, on the internet, so we can continue from there. But we're not stopping. We're just actually going to have a conversation. So now we're talking about it. So if somebody says, hey, what's the next slide? Well, <laughs> I have this. So we can talk about it. And I have the cake. Yes, and he has the cake. So thank you guys for listening on this uh, 30 minutes. And we're going to continue here, OK? Um, so I, I, I promised Doug, I said, look, don't speak for too long, because we have a very active audience. And very vibrant discussion group, so feel yourselves worthy of QJ. Uh, speak up or hold your peace forever, uh, which is what they say at wedding, technically. Yes. So it's good to, very good yes. to say. So, uh, yes, go yeah, well. Do I need a mic or? No, no, no you don't. You don't. Uh, okay. so well, I think you're recording it. Right? Recording. Yeah, is it easier if we get a mic?
you take this? No, 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 no. We'll take this one. Or if I can take a remote, that's actually better. We'll take, we'll take this one. Then. So, yeah, we'll, we'll give you this mic. I think it's the better. Sorry. It just takes this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Hungary, but I'm not an expert. I'm a layman. I'm not from Hungary. So. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is you mentioned a lot of countries involved in this business, yeah. almost all ASEAN countries, yeah. except for Malaysia, Indonesia. Mm -hmm. Is this because of the religious background that Muslim countries are not neither on the seller or the buyer side of this business? And, uh, and my other question is what could be the percentage breakdown of these? Mm. Uh, textbook cases of the international marriages. Okay, great questions. Uh, so first of all, the office that I was at down in Bangkok focused, to, focused just on the Mekong region. So, which is just the six countries that are still on the mainland there, does not include Malaysia and Indonesia. Excuse me, you do have Indonesians uh, doing marriage migration, uh, Malaysians as well. It's just less studied, um, and it's honestly a gap in my own knowledge, but it does happen. Um, the second question is the 6.4 million yen question, basically. Uh, we don't know. <clears throat> basically, optimistically, in the region that I studied, anthropologists think that most of them will fall under somewhere in the first two with, with some of this stuff being not uncommon. But that's not data. That's sort of anecdotal evidence. The uh, Vietnamese government was very ambitious in this area and declared that 10% of marriage migrants uh, from Vietnam to Taiwan were victims of human trafficking of one of these types, which would mean there'd be about 14,000 of them in the total population. Sounds like a good number, but we don't have any idea of the methodology. It means it's not really a marriage, but... Um, uh, yeah, so they... tend to be a marriage. In exactly. Yeah, the, the forced marriage, meaning... Um, Let's say the broker tells the woman, oh, I've got this rich guy in Taipei. He's going to take good care of you. She lands. They drive her out to the countryside, put her with some guy out there. He takes her passport and says, if you try to leave, I'll kill you. That's a forced marriage. Uh, other times, he doesn't even want to marry her. He just wants to sell her off to a local brothel. Yeah? Victoria? <laughs> I have three questions. Yeah. Um, do you know about divorce rates? Second, what happens to the lady after the divorce? Does she stay? Can she stay or does she have to return? And third, if they have children, what happens to the children? Okay. Uh, so why don't we take two and a half hours? Right, let's talk about that issue. That is actually an issue that I'm working on right now. Uh, which can. Let me see how I can uh, make this as succinct as possible. Uh, the divorce rates vary from country to country. Uh, I want to say that Taiwan, and, and this is going off my memory, so I could be entirely wrong. I want to say that it was 20 to 25 percent uh, as of about four years ago. But the problem is that uh, getting a divorce can be quite difficult in some of these countries. It also doesn't help if you don't speak the language and you need the husband to agree to this divorce because he's the one that's going to fill out the paperwork. Um, it, it does seem to be either on par or slightly lower than the population, but we don't know how many people who have either just fled or who have wanted divorce who can't get them or hiding in there. So it's not an accurate information. Um, the second thing actually is if you get a divorce as a marriage migrant, if all you have is your marriage visa, if you can't change that visa to something else, you've got to go. And that's what makes marriage migrants very vulnerable to uh, abuse. But basically, the husband can either say or imply, if you misbehave, I will divorce you and you will go home. And of course, going home can be an incredible stigma because it looks like a failure. Or your family might be really depending on that money, so you can't do that. Uh, but let's say that she does get the divorce. Um, depends on the country. Um, Japan and uh, Taiwan, for sure, if you have children and you get custody of them, you can stay. As a matter of fact, I think South Korea is also the case. The problem is getting that custody can be hard. Uh, I understand in Taiwan, they tend to give it to the national, not to the foreign spouse. So that can be a problem. 
The nice thing, though, about being a marriage migrant is if you can stick it out and you can actually get uh, your husband's agreement to give you permanent residency. He doesn't need to, you know, say yes, but he needs to fill out the paperwork usually. You get that, you can divorce your fine. So until that happens, your legal status there is a little bit shaky. Do we know uh, what percentage get permanent residence or a lot of the husbands are reluctant to agree to it? Yeah, they, a lot of the husbands, at least anecdotally uh, in Taiwan, were very reluctant to do so. Uh, the brokers had even said, you shouldn't give, some of the brokers, I should say, have said you don't want her to get permanent residency. Um, I actually don't know the percentage of, of permanent residence. I do understand that the, uh, the trend in Taiwan has been towards more permanent residency and even towards citizenship, which is why um, in Taiwan, a lot of the Vietnamese women uh, have actually formed really good sort of polit not political groups, but advocacy groups uh, to push for their rights. And they weren't able to really do that until their status was permanent resident or citizen. And, and the third question is about children, right? Yeah. What ah. happens to the children in the case of ah. divorce? Yeah, so one of them, one of the, the uh, spouses gets custody. And generally, um, because they are uh, a child of the national, they're going to get citizenship. So they have the right to stay. And so what can be really terrible is the husband, if the husband's bad, will say, okay, I'm divorcing you, you go home, the kids stay with me. So the fear of losing contact with their children is so great that even if they're in a domestic violence situation, they'll stay in it so they can stay with their children. What do we do to follow up on Victoria's question? What do we know in terms of the children's uh, performance at school? In other words, I mean, obviously they start with a disadvantage because they have one parent who doesn't know the language. Yeah. Uh, you know, given the difficulty of learning Korean or, or Taiwan or, or Chinese, it, it's unlikely that the mother has really become fluent in terms of reading and writing, I would assume. Mm -hmm. So so what happens to the kids? In terms, do we have any idea of they handicap the school in terms of performance? What I can also look down upon because of the, where their mother comes from? And yeah. We know? So um, a number of things. So first of all, on a, on a broader uh, perspective, there's the issue of how these countries are supporting these marriage migrants and their children. Uh, so obviously, if the if the wife is struggling with the language, let alone with you know uh, helping her child with school, that's going to be a disadvantage. Um, depending on the country, they're better or worse at uh, giving the children the necessary additional education they might need or additional support. Um, so, for example, South Korea has this multicultural families initiative um, where all the way down to the local level, they try to provide <coughs> as much additional support as they can for the kids and the parents. Now, it's not, there's been some criticism about it. Um, it hasn't been as effective as it should be. I'm not an expert on that area, but at least they're trying. Taiwan is the same. Uh, Japan at the national level, not so much. There's local support. Uh, when I was in Ajita, uh we had two kids in my small town, uh, one uh, Filipino-Japanese and one Chinese-Japanese. And every week, there would be uh, a special tutor who would come. But I understood that that was the exception and not the rule. So it's it's a big issue that these countries are dealing with. I was a former uh, Vietnam correspondent in early 1990s. Yeah. Uh, at that time, I was just starting uh, I'm Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. came to uh, Ho Chi Minh City to looking for a potential you know, bride. Mm -hmm. And also Europeans came to Hanoi and my ah. area to pick up the babies for adopted son. But uh, my question is about uh, what is the percentage of uh, overseas Chinese uh, so the marrying? Because there are some overseas Chinese connections among yeah. the Southeast countries, I mean, mm -hmm. Vietnam, Taiwan, or Malaysia. Yeah, um, so the interesting thing is there's a lot of marriage migration between these overseas communities, or in English, the diaspora. Um, as a matter of fact, the Taiwanese love to get brides from the diaspora. So they think the same Chinese, they speak the same language, even if it's a different country, that's okay. Um, so there is quite a bit of movement. Um, in addition, that goes beyond just the Chinese communities. Um, the Korean communities abroad are also great sources for brides. Now, me being an American, when I think of overseas Korean communities, I think Korean Americans. But what they're talking about are Korean Chinese in northern China. They're talking about Koreans in, I believe, Kazakhstan. There's like these small Korean communities over there. In the beginning, that's where a lot of the Korean 
uh, husbands were getting their brides because they were thinking, well, the same language must be same culture. It didn't turn out to be entirely true, and the numbers were relatively small. So, yeah, to your question, amongst these diaspora, there's quite a bit of uh, marriage migration. Oh, and I should add, um, just as a historical footnote, um, this also happened with Japan. A century ago, we had the picture brides. So in the San Francisco area, um, and probably other parts of California and America, the men would come over, couldn't bring their women. Um, they might not even have a girlfriend. And so back in Japan, they would put all these pictures of women together. They'd send the book over, open the book up, and they go, okay, I'll pick this one. Three, four months later, she'd come over, and it was, nice to meet you, will you marry me? Okay. <laughs> put the ring on the finger, there you go. If you were lucky. If you were not lucky, you were sold into a brothel. So even back then, there were dangers in marriage migration. So, uh, but it's been happening for a century. And it's not just uh, Japan either. Over on uh, Ireland, over to the United States as well. What else we got? Yeah. You mentioned multicultural family policy. Um, the multicultural family policy in Korea you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and that's a very interesting case. I mean, you'd expect intermarriage to generate a, a multicultural attitude in society if all's going well. In Japan, at the national level, as you said, that doesn't exist so much, but at the local level, it does. What is what is it like in Taiwan? And probably China, I, I don't know if you would know. What's it like in other countries which are experiencing marriage migration? Sure, great question. Um, so Taiwan has not done the full scale push that South Korea has at least shown. Um, however, Taiwan has pushed uh, for a lot better support. So for example, when a bride comes over, um, they will notify the local town where her husband lives, and there will be somebody from the local health and welfare office who will come over, meet her, uh, first of all, make sure she's there and safely, um, make sure she can come out to Chinese lessons, um, to all this level of education, um, that is available. And so comparatively speaking, it's pretty good support uh, from what I understand. The criticism, however, is that it's all focused on the migrant. It's about making that person adjust to that culture. And very little opportunity for people in that culture to adjust to the presence of new people from another country. To assimilation. Right, but it's not done so well because basically you still have these very strong prejudiced views about non-Taiwanese, whether they're of Chinese ancestry or some other Southeast Asian ancestry. So you have this sort of, um, this sort of basically bump up against each other. They're trying to bring them in, but they're still trying to be one land, one people. And they're sort of negotiating that at this point. Um, if you're interested in that, there's a, a couple of articles that came out uh, at the end of last year um, in uh, Asia, Pacific, and Migration Studies. Um, it's out of the Philippines. If I can follow up on this, you mentioned Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, why don't Taiwanese men get brides bri uh, from China? They do. Vietnam? So they do, but it can be difficult. Um, on the one hand, you, know, you have the same country, same culture. Um, and on the other hand, you have uh, a lot of difficulties legally in getting them over. Uh, the Taiwanese are, are very um, hesitant about bringing over a lot of mainland Chinese <coughs> wanting to keep their culture the way it is. And there's political issues involved as well. Um, but to be sure, that number of 240,000, the majority are coming from mainland China. Yeah. And of course, the Chinese government views it as internal migration because it's one China. Yeah, we'll bring you a uh, I know your focus is uh, on migration within Asia, but I'm yeah. just curious, how much of a demand is there with Western countries, like the US or Europe, high. for Asian rights? Oh, high. Um, high enough that at least the US, if not a good number of European countries, have uh, set up laws around marriage brokers. They're not, of course, all just getting brides from East and Southeast Asia. It's also Eastern Europe. Um, but we saw a lot of those women, uh, particularly from Thailand and Indonesia, going off to Western Europe. Um, I come from the West Coast of the US. We had plenty of uh, Thai, Vietnamese, and Chinese brides. And part of it is because we had established communities there. Uh, so definitely the demand is there. And what are the laws right now? Um, so in the US law, 
explain around this correctly, they, uh, they regulate marriage brokers. And to be honest, I haven't looked at it in, in some time, so I don't remember the specifics, but it's regulated. I don't know about the laws in Western Europe. I've just heard tell that they also have regulations. I should add, though, that from the uh, East Asian perspective, um, South Korea regulates marriage brokers. You can still do it commercially, so you can make a profit. But if you don't follow the rules, the fines are heavy, and you can go to jail. There's criminal charges involved. So if you lie about a potential husband, you don't do the proper background check, and something happens, you can be liable. Taiwan has outlawed commercial marriage brokers. Only nonprofits can be marriage brokers. What does that mean? All the marriage brokers became nonprofits. <laughs> That's it. But at least the government, in theory, is watching them closely. What about Japan? There's no law. Now, I heard tell there was an attempt at making a law, but the, the industry pushed back hard against it. There is now a uh, voluntary uh, kind of seal of approval within the industry that doesn't mean a lot. And so actually part of my research is to see how the legal system in Japan is working now, how, it, how does it compare to South Korea and Taiwan, and which of those two systems, or some sort of third system, would be most appropriate for Japan. Is the marriage migration between East Asia and the U.S. and Europe and Canada mm -hmm. within Asian communities, or is it, or are the customers non-Asian? Yeah, sadly, this is outside of my area of expertise. Uh, what I do understand is that they do go a lot to the diaspora, but there is also quite a bit of uh, to non-Asian as well. I don't know the proportion. <laughs> As you said, that China is a sending country as well as a receiving country. I think possibly all of those countries, in lesser degrees, are both receiving and sending. It's sort of like a, yeah. a cycle, isn't it? And so uh, Japan, of course, is not necessarily brokering women out, but a lot of Japanese women are leaving and marrying people in Australia or in the United States or Western Europe. And that's one of the sources of the, the need, the lack of women in Japan. So, what about in a country like Taiwan or Vietnam or uh, those less um, economically developed countries? Are they all also receiving marriage? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, first to your point on just the broader marriage migration. So it's true in, in all developed countries, too. You have out-migration, and particularly in Japan, and you should probably say also South Korea, too. You have women leaving. I'm not sure if it's just to get married or if it is to go off and do something else. Um, for my research, I was looking at just the broker side. So it does seem that over the last 20 years, Taiwan and South Korea in particular have gone from being both importers and exporters to just being importers. And I think that's just a factor of them becoming richer. They don't need brokers. There was a second question. But anyway, um, I think that there is a, a lack of co being caused in a country like Japan as well. Yeah. Because the women are becoming so much more powerful and, you know, on right. Some of the cultural changes are definitely what's driving some of this. Oh, your question was to um, other countries like Thai Thailand, Vietnam, some of these other countries. Are they sending and receiving too? I believe that there is some migration into Thailand and Vietnam from poor neighboring countries like Laos and Myanmar, but I don't have stats on it. I think also to your question about the, the impact of supply and demand in Japan, I think my anecdotal evidence I think, is that Japanese women who have married and move say, to North America or Europe or Australia are probably not the type of women who anyhow would marry farmers in Akita. So it's not it's not like the farmer in Akita has lost his bride because she's married an Australian professor, because she probably, rightly or wrongly, wasn't in the market for a farmer in Akita. So I think it's, it's a very different segment of the population socioeconomically. Yeah, it's the same conversation with different the parts, century, basically. Though. Yeah, okay, let's get that gentleman over there. Uh, looking at the, your slide with the push-pull thing, yeah. um, one would expect Japan to rank relatively high in terms of the poll, especially compared to South Korea and Taiwan. Sure. But when you showed the rate at which these uh, marriages are occurring, it was yeah. uh, 1 in 9 in Taiwan, 1 in 11 in South Korea, but it yeah. was 1 in 20 for Japan. Yeah. Uh, what's driving that, <coughs> you know, Two-fold difference, and should will it be changing, uh, you know, to a more South Korea or Taiwan type model? Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know if there's been any consensus on what's driving this. Um, one part, and this is my own interpretation, is that Taiwan and South Korea, being smaller countries, um, 
you know, respond to a smaller number of people. And both countries, more so than Japan, for whatever reason, have said we need to have more women coming in uh, for marriage. The demographic issues don't seem that different between the three countries, but for whatever reason, those, those two countries have made the decision to really push with it. And so when you have um, a policy structure that encourages that, I think you see more. Um, with Japan, I don't believe the national government has really ever talked much about this issue. It's all been really local. And um, northern Japan got burned pretty badly back in the 80s and 90s with local governments uh, basically linking up with these brokers. Um, there's a lot in the news uh, about these women being abused, them being disappeared, and the governments were being criticized. And so they just sort of took their hands off of it and just left it be. Um, it doesn't help that immigration, um, but immigration in, if you've got it, a bride is pretty easy. But the immigration policy overall is still pretty strict here. I, I think one issue, to, to answer your question, Bobby, has to do with the preference for male children. Yeah. That in Korea and, and Taiwan, you've had selective abortion of female fetuses, yeah. so, which you don't have in Japan. Right. So in a, in a rural area, in, in Korea and, Ta and Taiwan, you're probably more likely to have a shortage of females yeah. because they weren't born, which right. is the same problem they have in China. Yeah. Japan doesn't have this. I mean, you know, the demographic data for Japan is very normal. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it's one of the very few East Asian countries. I think, it, it could, unlike China, unlike Taiwan, like Korea, Korea has gotten a little better. I mean, the, yeah. the, the level of selective sex abortion has gone down. Yeah. Uh, you see that even mildly. I mean, there's research done even on Asian immigrants in Canada, yeah. where you still see selective sex abortion wow. uh, in the first and second generation. So yeah. that, that would explain for the reason, because yeah. already these guys are pretty low on the marriage market. Yeah. And on top of this, you got the imbalance. You know, their parents yeah. decided it wasn't a good idea to have daughters. Yeah. So and they've got a problem. Yeah, the, the little that I've, I've read on those numbers uh, suggests that the current generation of marriageable, marriage eligible people, age 20 to 30, in particular, has this imbalance. And then, like you said, as time goes on, it'll go back to normal. But that could be a, a, a huge factor. Yeah. What else we got? Yes. Yeah, I think it's important to understand that the government doesn't have any support. Do you have some more details from which countries are they? Sure. Um, so the 341,000 are just the registered wives from uh, 2000 until now. Uh, number one is mainland China. Uh, number two <coughs> is South Korea. Number three is the Philippines. Uh, number four is Thailand. And I think as a distant five, it's either Indonesia or Vietnam. The numbers, interestingly enough, are almost uh, China and then about half or South Korea, about half of the Philippines, and then half again. It's almost like exponential. Yeah. What else? Yeah, in the back, uh, Ira, and then. Yeah. You, you talked about what happens to uh, a woman after divorce. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's okay. <laughs> you talked about what happens to a woman after divorce. Um, yeah. I assume, for the most part, the men are older than the women. Yes. So what happens to the woman after hus the husband dies? Yeah. Um, so there can be some issues. And in fact, that was a fairly large legal issue here in Japan. Um, it might still be to some extent. If they're um, just on a marriage visa and the husband dies and there's no children, she can be in trouble. Um, just a straight up reading of the law in, in the past was that, well, she has no more reason to be here, so off she goes. Um, I understand that it's gotten it's a little bit better. Take good care of it. I'm sorry? It's an incentive to take good care of it. Oh, of course, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you want her to have a good, long life. Um, yeah, and I say that pretty, pretty flippantly because that seems to have been the treatment of these women. That here they have been here for years. They left their home country. They've learned Japanese or Korean or Taiwanese, <coughs> Mandarin. And then their husband dies, and they have to go home. And where is the justice in that? Um, I understand that, uh, and again, this is a part that I'm now researching. In Japan, there have been exceptions that have been made. And I actually have to find out whether that is just a case-by-case -case exemption, or if that is something enshrined in the law, that if you're married for a certain period of time. I don't think that's the case. Nope, I'm seeing a shake of the head now. So probably it's just based on a case-by-case -case basis. 
So um, in other countries, I don't know how it works in South Korea, but the, the basic issue is this. If you have a child, you're probably safe. If you don't, you might be in trouble. I should add, however, that Taiwan is very strict about older men marrying much younger women. Uh, last I heard, they put an age gap limit. It couldn't be more than about 20 years. <coughs> yeah. So you can't just go off to Thailand and marry a 20 year old if you're 60 or 40. You can't. They saw that as a, an area for abuse. Um, I should add though that in general, there's a 10 year age gap between the Vietnamese brides and their Taiwanese husbands. We got next here. Uh, so do you have kind of <coughs> yeah, I did. Um, we're talking about demographic imbalances as a yeah. driver here. Yeah. Um, and the list of the most common. You could speak uh, oh, yeah, the recording. Sorry. <laughs> the most common export countries. Um, I know India's one yeah. of the big problems for uh, demographic imbalance. Yeah. It wasn't on the list for any of the countries as the main thing. Um, is that less of an Asian <coughs> importing country, or what's, what's the story there? Yeah, so let me just clarify that my research has all been on the Mekong region. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so that's one thing. Um, no, the, the gender imbalance in particular has been strong in mainland China, and as Robert was saying, in Taiwan and South Korea to a lesser extent. And that's certainly driving things in the Mekong region. When they want 40 million women, and you only have a few hundred million people down south, they're going to start coming up. I'm, I'm absolutely sure that that's going to happen uh, in India and other parts of the world as well. And it is a big driver. Is, has, um, I mean, India, of course, is less rich than China, but India has a different <coughs> gender problem. Okay. I mean, in some areas of India, apparently, like 130 boys, 100. Uh, 129 to 100. What? 129, 129 to 100. 129, OK. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Has this started in India among rich, in richer rural Indians? This is outside my area of okay. expertise. <laughs> yeah, I'm Southeast Asian. Okay. Yeah. I have limits. So, we have more. We're waiting a long time. Everybody. Yeah. On, on the Japanese statistics, there's a huge number. But, uh, and you said the Chinese are the biggest and the uh, Koreans. Yeah. yeah. Are the Zainichi Koreans or, or the Chinese, the third, fourth, I don't know how many generations of Chinese and Koreans involved in this number, because then it can be very misleading. No, no um, it's, are... only, it's only those that have a marriage visa. So the Zainichi don't need that. OK. okay. Yeah. So they, they are they're permanent really migrants. Yeah. But yeah. I think what I was wondering about Zainichi bringing wine ah. from ah. Korea, right? Okay. Or, like, right? or like ethnic, ethnic Chinese in Japan bringing a wife from that can happen. Uh, this okay. number is where uh, one person is Japanese citizen, and okay. one is not. Now, so it does not include the Zainichi marrying no. the... Except if the Zainichi has, has taken out Japanese citizenship, you cannot tell. Okay, because he does, if he has current right. residence, he still needs to get a visa right. to his spouse, but that's right. not included. In that the is not included. Because no. he's not a Japanese. Right. I okay. have those stats, but those are separate okay. and they're much smaller. Okay. Yeah. And what do we do to follow a slightly different thing related to yeah. visas and to Japan? Japan at one point had a law uh, to bring what they called entertainers, yeah. which basically was prostitution. Sure. Uh, I believe the law was recently changed. I mean, there, there was a law with five to six. Yeah. Okay. And it's so this is a really interesting point. Um, as many of you may know, there used to be this entertainment visa, still is. Uh, Filipino women would come in, most number. Uh, other people would as well, but the Filipinos were the highest number. And um, a lot of times they were going into snack pubs or into soap plants, and human trafficking was happening. And for various reasons, the government said, okay, we're going to take that number way down. They cut it by something like 90%. And what happened after that was that a lot of those women then went and got so called fake marriages and came back in. Because while the government took down the number of visas, it didn't do anything to address the demand. Didn't know how. We don't know yet. We don't know how to do that, apparently. So, uh, long story short, they're coming in through these fake marriages. And that's one of the things that I'm looking at now. Uh, long story short, US, Europe, uh, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan all face this problem. Uh, a marriage visa is one of the best ways to come in because you can do just about any job that you want. 
And if you don't deal with your immigration policy so that you have the proper <coughs> visa for you know, your workers, they'll come in on this fake marriage. So I'm not just beating up on Japan here. Every single country, developed country, has this problem. Can you compare how Japan, Korea, and Taiwan check to make sure it's a real marriage? Mm -hmm. Let me uh, let me tell you as much as I can, because uh, some of this stuff is just not public. This is the problem. Um, Taiwan is the most strict. Uh, <coughs> if you're coming from Vietnam, you have to go to the local Taiwan Economic and Cultural Office with your potential husband. Sit down, have an interview. They will uh, so ask in you. Vietnam, the, the people Vietnam. the Taiwanese embassy in yeah, a consulate in Vietnam. That's right. The TICO office in. So the Taiwanese guy <coughs> has to fly to Vietnam. That's right. Okay. He has to fly to Vietnam. He has to sit down, have a conversation with the inspector and with his new wife, which is interesting if the wife doesn't speak Mandarin or he doesn't speak Vietnamese. So it's also a great way to check that a husband actually exists. Of course, there's ways around this. Um, there will be brokers standing outside coaching the uh, prospective bride on what to say. Uh, there have been a lot of criticisms that the, the questions that they ask aren't really helpful in figuring out what's a real marriage and what might be human trafficking. But since they instituted it, they've had a, a large number of uh, application rejections. And the government, the, the government in Taiwan at least, has said, no, this seems to be working. But time will tell. <laughs> uh, South Korea and Japan are a lot more lax. If you're a South Korean or a Japanese guy, you don't have to go to the office. You don't even have to go to that other country. You can uh, employ a lawyer, get some paperwork done, get it sent over. The level of proof that you need is much lower, which means it's much easier for people to come in on fake marriages. And that's a problem. The way the Taiwanese do it, though, is labor intensive. So you know, the, the comments that I've heard from the Japanese uh, officials that I've talked to have been, we don't have that kind of paperwork. And there are a lot of people. And I, I can't really make any criticism about that, because they don't know uh, what the budgetary impacts would be at this moment. I just have a funny question on statistics. The statistics that I've been seeing recently, which I, this is not my turf at all, but reading a bunch of stuff, uh, had Japanese marrying foreigners being approximately something like one out of six marriages now in Japan is a Japanese national marrying a non-Japanese national. Yeah. Not counting Zainichi. It's yeah. very interesting. That doesn't count. And, yeah. uh, but you have one in 20, but this is for Southeast Asian women marrying into Japan. What, this is what? for all women. So this is where the, the Japanese is the man and the bride is the, woman, is the foreign bride. Well, the other thing I've been told is that by far the largest number of foreigners marrying Japanese is foreign women marrying Japanese men. So the number I've been hearing yes. is very different than the number you have, which I'm a little interested in. Which is interesting. Yeah, because I actually got those numbers from uh, the Japanese government, from Ah. So they actually have huge tables where they'll have marriages generally, and then uh, the husband's Japanese, the wife is foreign, and then the wife is Japanese, husband, et cetera. Um, and I've seen those same numbers, and I'd love to know where those people are getting them from as well. They may be talking about total, because again, mine are just from 2000 to 2011. And from 2007, the number of marriages have actually been going down uh, because of the economic downturn, apparently. So maybe as a total, like going back to the 1980s, maybe it's higher? No, but you're talking about like the new. Marriage of international marriages yes. have gone down? Yes. The proportion? Both. They have taken a dip in the last four to five years. As a proportion of total marriage. And as an absolute number. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. as both, yeah. Well, I've heard different, but okay. Yeah, and I, <laughs> exactly. But the government numbers are what they're telling you. Um, let me just, with limited time left, folks who haven't had, uh, haven't been able to ask a question yet. Let me grab some. There's one there. Got one over here. And by the way, I'll stick around, so happy to ask additional questions. Uh, um, the, you talked about how like China's sort of pulling uh, women out of like Vietnam, that kind of thing. Do you see the government in the sending countries doing anything to stop the, because obviously then they'll end up with a deficit there. Yeah. So are they going to do anything to stop that? Yeah, it's kind of hard because um, the women who are successful in their marriages they send money back. So on the one hand, you do have this legitimate depopulation problem, and on the other hand, you've got money coming in. 
Um, there's a couple of great anthropologists who looked at what happened to the sending communities in Vietnam, and the locals do see it as quite a problem. At the same time, they all also see all the nice houses that they built. So it's something they haven't really figured out what to do. The second thing is that when something bad happens to a marriage migrant and it hits the news, then you can have international clashes. So for example, uh, the Cambodian government put a full stop on all marriage migrations to South Korea for I believe one to two months. Uh, Cambodian bride had been killed, I believe. Uh, husband, I believe, was, uh, had a history of mental issues. And the broker was supposed to have checked that, didn't, this happened. And they got all the way up to having a law ready. And then Korea said, wait, 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 we'll fix our laws. And they actually did. You mentioned the sending community. Is there a geographic uh, focus? In other words, are there a few villages or towns that have kind of specialized in <laughs> sending bras? Or is it more or less spread out within the country, if you look at the sending country? So this is a good question. Um, the problem with the research I have read has all been that they focused on specific communities. You kind of have to because you have limited time and everything. Um, I haven't seen straight up data that shows where. Um, it does seem to be that in the poor regions more people come from there, but yeah, sadly we don't have have a good sense of that. Uh, this gentleman over here, I think? Yep. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about push vectors, yeah. you using the Vietnamese example, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that daughters are expected to repay their parents. Yeah. Is that a region-wide sort of Confucian thing? And um, do you see that changing with the shortage of women? Boy, I wish I knew. Um, this came up specifically in the Vietnamese context, and they, they highlighted it as something that was special. So my sense is, no, you don't see that quite so much. Um, but that said, you know, if the, uh, if, if the family's not doing that well and the woman gets married, I wouldn't be surprised if she got a phone call saying, hey, we need some support here. But as a overall thing, no, I just heard of the Vietnamese. And then the gentleman right in front of him. My question is, what's the difference this and human trafficking? Uh -huh. This seems to be a very legitimate business. Uh -huh. And both parties are getting benefits out of it. But the question is, how long they can last? Because of the communication in different culture and different language won't be working, in my sense. I was surprised to find the Japanese number so high, but you didn't count on the divorce rate. Mm -hmm. And I know the failure because of the place that I was born and raised, yeah. right next to Akita, which was the Iwati. Yeah. And they are famous for the lacking the brooms. Ah. And uh, brides are all, always the easy target yeah. for the local politicians. Mm -hmm. That, as, I, as you said, in 1990s, that was the early age that they tried to do something in the local community levels. Yeah. But they were <coughs> late. No communication whatsoever. And they just, uh, the fake marriage yeah. in the end, losing 5 million yen in the end per person. And that's a number that I remembered. And the failure was so high. And that was the story that everybody remembered. So local government, as you said, gave up. So I don't think the Japanese case won't be lasting. And also, the, because of the uh, uh, crude, uh, let's say, the crucial uh, momentum getting the Japanese entirely the work harder, and let's forget about the marriage, okay. still working hard, so that we could get the better opportunities in the future. Mm -hmm. So I see the economy is affecting a lot to this issue as well, because of the immediate change of the destination for the capitals to China shifting to the other countries. So that therefore Indonesia yeah. and Malaysia may be also your yeah, next target. What do you think? Right, so a couple of things. Um, yeah, so there's some groups that say that this sort of brokered marriage is, is human trafficking. So I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer, so I always go back to definitions. Like, okay, what's human trafficking? What's marriage migration? Um, and long story short, if the woman and the husband are getting married of their own free will, and there's no coercion, it's a general rule, that's not human trafficking. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, under international law, um, everybody has the right to marry freely. They can't be forced. There's that. Now that said, within that huge spectrum, and you know, going back to that uh, spectrum that I ended at, uh, you can end up in human trafficking. Um, the idea that um, both parties always get a benefit is not always the case. Um, there are bad cases where the husband basically wants a domestic servant, he wants to have the status of a husband, and he wants to have a kid. And he will treat that woman as a domestic slave and as uh, easy sexual access. So uh, from my perspective, just putting it very simply, I want to see safe migration where the woman's human rights and her own personal security are respected, that she has uh, a stable uh, living status once she's in her destination country. Now, at the same time, what you said about these husbands who spend 5 million yen and the wife suddenly runs off, that, of course, is also an issue. We do have to think about that. You know, these, these men often take out one or two year loans and they don't make a lot of money and this person's gone. Um, in South Korea, the new marriage broker laws say that the broker has to uh, be truthful with both the husband and the wife. Um, if they make misrepresentations, the husband can sue. There's, there's more, it's almost a consumer protection law. There's a problem in that though. What are they consuming? Right? Are they consuming the service of, I'm going to introduce you to people, that's my service, or is it going to be, I have a product for you. Let's introduce you to your product. You are paying for this product. In bad cases, we have seen this in, say, Taiwan and Malaysia, uh, there's brokers that have on their contract, we guarantee the marriage is successful and the wife will not run away for one year. <laughs> right? They have a wife warranty. Basically, what we're talking about. And that brings up some pretty uh, deep questions about human rights and what it means to be a human being and how easy it is to modify an individual, particularly when you have very, very different economic levels. There's a huge power imbalance there. And making sure that that power balance is mitigated and that both parties are doing this of their own free will and that international criminal organizations are not using this to move human cargo through uh, is the number one goal. Not to mention all of the other things about uh, getting people in here and cultural adaptation. What's going to happen in the future, uh, who knows. Um, from my own personal experience in Southeast Asia, Japan has a lot of soft power. People love Japan. You know, anytime I was in some place and I happened to speak a little Japanese, they immediately wanted to talk about Japan. It's still an attractive place to go. What else we got? Yes, sir. So, I want to go back to the uh, Misuber community in Japan. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that there were clusters. Yeah. And maybe in certain prefectures. Yeah. And possibly certain social economic uh, background. Yeah. So, uh, can you go on? A little bit more in depth. You got it. Uh, Absolutely. Um, and it's, it, it actually has shifted quite a bit throughout the last 30 or so years. The big story back in the 80s and 90s was Tohoku, the Northeast. Um, more and more, if you look at the last 10, 11 years, the main centers have actually been Kanto, uh, have been Aichi, Nagoya, um, Kansai region, Fukuoka. Those areas have, have actually been in. Uh, for a period of time, though, uh, Yamagata actually had the highest proportion of foreign brides. The numbers now have since gone down. Um, we're basically seeing, and this is just sort of my general understanding, um, you have these foreign communities in these big regions. And so as new brides come in, they'll go wherever that community is if they can. Um, and that's pretty natural. That happens in just about any country. So nowadays, yeah, you're looking at the bigger metropolitan areas. Um, but in terms of percentages, the, the countryside still has a fairly high percentage. So, so what's driving the, the trend? Um, from rural areas to ur urban centers? That's a good question. Um, that's, that's an area that I'm still working on, actually. Um, one thing, of course, is just the lack of jobs. There are more jobs you know, down south. Um, there's also a lot more brokers down south. If you go to Shin um, you can, yeah, you can go to Shin and you can talk to Korean brokers. If you go to Ueno, I understand that there are some, also some Chinese brokers. So I think it's, and Again, I'm more a lawyer than an anthropologist. 
Um, I think it is that these communities are just coming together into these places, and more people are heading over there just as a result. And that's where the demand is coming from as well. Um, that's about the best that I've got. And is the demand side, is there any um, trend in socioeconomic background, age? Yeah, it, it does seem to be, um, and I, I don't have data as concrete as I do for Taiwan and South Korea yet, but it does seem to be uh, folks in the countryside, folks of a lower economic status. Uh, but I am very curious to see what uh, these, the economic background is for these people who have uh, a foreign spouse. I'm going to see where I can get that data from. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Last one. Okay, so um, okay. they are small in number, but yeah. what about the men? I'm sorry? They are small in number, but what about the men? Are there male marriage migrants, and what kind of people are they? Yeah, so most of the literature that I have gone through for all three countries have really not talked about that. They've all said, oh, it's you know this very small number. Where I've seen these marriage migrants have been actually on these so-called fake marriages. They want to come in here to work. Uh, this really does seem to be a phenomenon of women, at least in this region. It could be different in other regions. Um, one of the reasons, at least for uh, Southeast Asia, is that the men will have some sort of marketable skill, even if it's just they can pick up a shovel, and they can work really hard, or they can work hard on a boat. Um, in a lot of these cases, the women have, women have even less experience or less educational attainment, and so all they have is their ability to get married. So if you can find any stories of male marriage migrants, <laughs> let me know. Because there have been very, very few, probably almost none that I've seen. So you don't think there's money to be made for internet groups? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. yeah. this, yeah. this is the business school and law school building of PUJ. Oh, oh well. Wow. <laughs> Let's, OK. Uh, so the bigger picture, of course, is that marriage <laughs> migrants are not just those between two different economic groups, right? Um, the jet setters, the people who are too busy, the CEOs. They also have their own sort of uh, meeting sites, their day IK, as it were. Um, yeah, there's plenty of that. The thing is that there's almost, I don't want to say almost none, but there's far less of this power imbalance because you have people from very rich strata marrying people from a very rich strata. The part that I'm more concerned about are these brokers that are taking these four of them. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.